you. I'm going to. OK, and I just want to check if you can see that if I just move the cursor. Yes, yes. You can see that. Yep. OK, great, mm -hmm. great, 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 great. OK, so anyway, Happy New Year to everybody. And I hope you're staying out of the freezing, freezing temperatures. I'd like to thank Tim for inviting me to give this presentation and a special thanks to Maggie also for um, oh no, I'm the wrong way. Sorry. Thanks also to Maggie because she brought our class out to uh, on a walk, on a bird walk, and it was one of the highlights of our geography fieldwork classes um, last year or last semester. And also, I'd like to acknowledge our um, team that worked with me. Rong uh, Yu was a graduate student and she started to monitor the trees of Downer Woods. And then Chloe came along a couple of years later and she was looking at the shrubs. And Mark Schwartz, Schwartz was the one who set up the whole um, Downer Woods monitoring um, system. So this morning I'm going to talk to you a bit about monitoring and the different types of monitoring that we do from ground level monitoring to satellites and also in between where we use um, a camera mounted on Sandberg. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about phenology and what phenology is. Every single organism on the planet develops and grows. So a dormant bud is going to um, grow and develop into a leaf. Uh, an egg is going to develop into a chick. A caterpillar is going to develop into a moth or a, um, a, cat or a butterfly. So all of these developmental stages, the study of these developmental stages is called phenology. And the phenophases or the, the growth stages themselves are called phenological stages. And something in the environment triggers this growth and development. So something in the environment triggers a dormant bud to start to, to develop into a, a leaf. And the environmental cue that we're particularly interested in is temperature. So once temperature starts to rise in spring, it triggers this movement in the ecosystem. And of course, if climate is changing and that temperature is changing, that will have a significant influence on this growth and development. And as you know, there's not one single organism on the planet that survives on its own. So there are interdependent relationships that have evolved over hundreds and thousands of years. And if they don't respond in the same way to climate change, we can see mismatches. But that's a whole other lecture. So how is phenology determined? I'll go through a little bit about that where we look at, we go out. It's part of some people's jobs to go out and monitor different species, whether it's plants or animals or birds or whatever. And we can also look at the landscape scale by using satellites, but then to get something in between, we have other methods of doing that. And some of them can be near surface cameras or a range of other things. So I'm going to um, focus really on Darna Woods. I'm going to talk a little bit about the in situ data, which is just when we go out and we observe the, the um, shrubs and the trees. And as you can imagine, that's very labor intensive. So we have to go out every couple of days for an intensive period in spring and autumn. We monitor shrubs, oh sorry, we monitor shrubs, we monitor native shrubs and non-native shrubs and compare them because some of the phenology of the non-native shrubs can provide a competitive advantage against the native shrubs. And we'll talk a little bit about the trees as well. Then I'm going to talk about how we use remote sensing to capture some of the phenological data such as phenocams, just like your webcam, except it's just monitoring the phenology. And then I'll talk a little bit about two satellite projects. MODIS is just a very common, very large scale um, satellite. And Venus is just a smaller and um, higher resolution that gives us a bit more information about the phenology. And then I want to talk a bit about the discrepancies between why we see such huge differences in the timing of, let's say we're just monitoring um, bud burst. So the, we monitor bud burst in situ, we go out and, and collect the data, or a satellite can pick up greening in the environment. So we see huge differences in the timing of when we monitor, monitor bud burst um, in situ or from the satellite data. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. So first of all, just to talk a bit about the phenology and the timing, and again, and what phenology is. So phenology is basically the timing of the seasons. So we have these recurring 
life cycle events in plants and animals. These are happen pretty much every at the same time every year. So here we have an example of a dormant bud of um, poplar. And you can see these different growth stages or these different phenological stages or phenophases for short until we have the leaf unfolded completely, uh, the leaf unfolded. So what we monitor as bud burst, every phenological network defines its own phenological stages. So that kind of complicates things. But anyway, what we talk about bud burst, we talk about when the uh, bud scales have parted completely, like this here, for example. So these are just like, oh, this is just um, the, bird, the bud is beginning to develop. So bud burst is when the scales part and full leaf unfolded is when you can see the little petiole or the little leaf stalk. So that's how we determine the different phenological phases. We have other examples, um, including the timing of flowering um, of a wide range of species or leaf fall in autumn. I'll talk about leaf fall in a moment. We see bird migration dates. I'm sure you know a lot more about those than I do. So we have the bird migration in spring um, or it, birds can leave in fall or you know, a wide range of different um, migration methods as well. H egg hatching dates, egg laying dates, all of these occur at roughly the same time every year. Appearance dates of insects, um, again, occur at roughly the same time every year, and that's a phenological phase for insects. And this is what I was talking about earlier about the mismatch. This is a photograph of a um, mosquito on a dry octopetala in the Arctic. And if the timing of when the flower is um, needs to be pollinated and the insect, if they're not in sync, we can see a mismatch in the timing of when the plant needs to be pollinated. And that can have repercussions for the uh, broader ecosystem. Other phenological stages are things like ice melt. Now these are pseudo phenological phases because they're not biological in nature, but again, they occur at roughly the same time every year. So all of these spring phenological phases are driven by something in the environment. So there's something in the environment that triggers this growth and development to happen. And we're interested in it because temperature is the key, particularly in spring. Autumn is a more a different kind of a, a beast altogether because in autumn, even if the leaves, even if the temperature stays warm right up until Christmas, the leaves will still color and fall off the trees because day length or photo period um, drives autumn phenology as well. But in spring, Temperature is the overriding um, driver of spring phenology. Light has a little bit of an effect, but not as much as in autumn. And then, of course, in drier conditions, we see that um, rainfall can trigger, in, in a very dry environment, rainfall can trigger phenology. But we're just sticking with temperature because any change in temperature is going to impact our spring phenology. And that can have implications for the ecosystem as a whole. So some of the methods we use for determining phenology are, um, for example, in situ observations. There are networks all over the planet that are collecting phenological data. So these professional networks, this is an example from Ireland. This is one of a garden um, that's part of the International Phenological Garden Society, which is a European wide um, endeavor. And uh, the German weather service way back in the 1950s thought it would be a good idea to send trees to all the weather stations. Well, a lot of the weather stations around Europe and to monitor the phenology. So to monitor the timing of bud burst leaf unfolding and autumn events as well. And this graph here shows an example of some of the data that we can find from that. So this is a long-term, it goes back to 1968, a long-term data series. And what you can see is there's huge variation, year-to-year uh, -year variation in the timing of when this is particular um, beech tree, when leaf unfolding occurs or bud burst or any of the spring phenological phases. But overall, you can see that it's getting earlier in the season. So this long-term data is very, very useful. And this is from a professional network where people are trained to do this and they go out and they collect the data. We also have large citizen science um, networks. And here's one just from Ireland as well, where we have kids going out and you get them really to look closely 
up the trees. So in the US, there's the USA National Phenology Network, and they depend on volunteers, like on citizen science to collect data. You have to be very, very careful with your protocol. It has to be very, very clear, um, but you can get a lot of data over a, a large area, whereas the professional networks have a longer time series um, and on fewer species. We can also use remote sensing um, to collect information on phenology. Satellites can cover a whole landscape um, on a daily basis, which we cannot do that by individuals. So uh, we also have this, sorry, this is an example. EVI is just enhanced vegetation index. There are sensors on the satellites that can detect vegetation and detect greenness, but also vegetation. So this is um, from uh, our down our woods and we can see that there's darker red and more yellowy areas. So the darker colors are a uh, higher density vegetation, but only really tells us that there's vegetation there. And um, this is an ex uh, a photograph from our PhenoCam, which is a near surface camera. And we can also see that uh, this is obviously taken in autumn or at the very start of autumn, and we can see the different colors. And then another in, uh, way we get some phenological information is to use modeling. Not really gonna talk much about this, but the models can predict when bud burst is going to occur. Now, all of this information is useful because it can tell us the carbon budget, and we're all really interested in carbon budgets of different <clears throat> ecosystems. So, and the future, what we're seeing in the future here is in general, we're seeing that phenology is getting earlier at a range of different sites in Ireland, but there are variations across sites. But in future, we expect to see bud burst to occur earlier, and that will have implications for timber and all sorts of things. So the International or the Intergovernmental Pan Panel on Climate Change in 2007 used phenological information to really convince policymakers that there was something happening in the environment and that it was driven by uh, increasing temperatures. So in their report, they have written that phenology is perhaps the simplest process in which to track changes in the ecology of species in response to climate change. And it's also a very easy way, people understand phenology, you know, in a second, like kids really understand it very, very quickly, that if the temperature rises, these things happen earlier in the season, and that can have implications for the dynamics of the particular um, ecosystem. So some of the uses, I'm going to check my time. Some of the uses um, of phenology in a daily life, it helps predict um, and address hazards, for example, um, for wildfires, pests and diseases, and invasion. So the timing of when there's volatile organic compounds in the vegetation, this can tell us if the firefighters know when this is going to happen, we can predict when and where wildfires might occur. We know that some organ or some ecosystems are vulnerable to pests and diseases. So if we if we know that, then we might be able to plan for that in the future and to um, use pesticides or whatever to reduce the impact of the pest. Invasion. We know that invasive species have different phenology than native species, and we that can help us to manage invasive species. So, for example. In autumn, if invasive species stay green or longer in the environment, that gives us an opportunity to use a herbicide to kill off the invasive species. Planning cultural and recreational events, we know that everybody wants to go to um, Washington DC, well, not everybody, but a lot of people might want to go to Washington DC to see the uh, cherry blossom bloom. So you need to time your um, activities to coincide with the timing of the full bloom. Ecotourism, you want to go and see the whales or the sand hill, the, yeah, the cranes um, in Wisconsin, you need to be able to time that to coincide with the timing of the migration of the birds. And of course, wildflower displays in the Alps or um, autumn color in uh, New England. So these are, you know, why phenology is in our everyday lives. The flu season, we talk about the flu season, 
We need to know the timing of the viruses and when they're more active, and then the um, hospitals and doctors can plan for that. Allergies. We know that with climate change, that the pollen season is not only starting earlier, but it's also becoming more intense and lasting longer. So this, we might only be measuring the pollen, the time of the pollen release in trees and other plants, but that has implications for the doctors, for the people who suffer, of course, from these um, allergies, um, to the hospitals preparing for um, an increase in allergies or people suffering from allergies to Kleenex manufacturers to everything there's a lot of we might be measuring one thing in the environment but it has implications across a large range of our daily lives and agriculture phenology is hugely important for agriculture because we need to have the timing of the application of fertilizer for example if you have a wheat crop fertilizer is applied when the ear is just forming in the plant itself. If you apply the fertilizer too early, the plant can't use it or too late, well then it's too late. So the timing of these things are all very important. So how I got involved um, in phenology was way back um, in the 1990s. Um, I was looking at, I was asked to look at the how climate change was impacting Irish wildlife. And I was like, well, the climate the temperatures only increased by around about one degree. And surely that could not have an impact on wildlife in Ireland. But we were so flabbergasted. This is kind of when the whole phenology thing got started. And if you really look at the data and scrutinize the data, yes, there's huge variation in the timing from year to year. But if you look at that overall, over what, a 30 or 40 year period, we can see that, in, this is just one example, that leaf out is occurring two weeks earlier now than it did in the 1960s or 1970s. And that has implications for other organisms that depend on um, the early leafing as a food source or for birds that are migrating, um, if the caterpillars are not, that are eating the early leaves, if they are um, occurring earlier and then the birds are migrating earlier, but if the birds are not migrating early enough, they can miss the peak in abundance of caterpillars and therefore that can have implications for the, um, for the birds, for the chicks in the nest. So we see this, we're just monitoring one thing, but it has broader implications. The Hoover swan arrives in Ireland from Iceland um, in October kind of time. And the timing of when they arrive hasn't changed, but their departure time has significantly um, gotten earlier and earlier. So they're departing from Ireland much earlier in the season in spring. So they used to depart on the 1st of March and now it's around about the 1st of February. And then they're departing to back to Iceland but their habitat and food source in Iceland needs to be ready for them um, at the same time. So all of these things are highly synchronized. And I just show all of this data here because these are copy books that we have to pull out this data from. And you can see there was this one guy, he would sit at a lake and monitor every single bird every single day that arrived to that lake. And we were able to extract some of the data for the um, Hooper Swan and to look at these trends over time. He, he just loved observing the birds and we'd turn over the page and then that would be it. Would never really look at the data. It was just curious to see what was happening on a daily basis, but it became very useful for us. I'm not really going to talk about this th because of time, but um, phenology took me to Honduras. We were doing a uh, record we were doing a botanical survey now I have no idea about that but I was just there to help but we were doing a botanical survey but we had to return in 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 a different year in order to collect seeds but we had to time our timing to coincide when the tree was producing seeds and this was another one when I was in the arctic in Greenland looking at the mismatch in the timing of um autumn phen or of spring vegetation phenology and the caribou calving times. So this is what we're all here for. So a brief history of Darna Woods. Well, Darna Woods was once part of a much more extensive woodland, as you probably know, and eventually was gifted to the Milwaukee Darna College 
uh, by the Fister family. And at that stage, Downer Woods was about 30 to 35 acres, whereas today it's only about 11 um, acres. And then it was transferred to UWM in 1964, and the Board of Regents and the Planning Authority approved the complete removal of the entire woodland. But thankfully, um, Dennis Conta, who was in the state legislature at the time, and he was chair of the Finance Committee, he was appalled at this decision because he was an avid defender of the environment and was also in a position to be able to overturn the decision to remove the woodland. So without Dennis Conta, we would not be, it, Downer Woods wouldn't be in its existence today and we wouldn't have it as a, it's a resource for teaching and for research uh, on campus, like you only have to walk two minutes to get to your field station. I mean, anybody who does field work is like hugely jealous of us. So that's how we ended up um, with Downer Woods. So why did I start looking at the shrub layer? As soon as you walk into a woodland, people see the trees. And that's why all of the phenological data that we have is really on trees. But if you're trying to do a carbon budget for the entire ecosystem, you cannot ignore the shrubs. Yes, there's a lot, lot smaller uh, than the trees, but they leaf out much earlier in spring and they stay greener a lot longer into the autumn. Not only that, but they um, photosynthesize. So if they're photosynthesizing before the trees start to photosynthesize, they are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere before the trees at the extremes of the uh, spring and autumn. So it's at the extremes of the growing season where shrubs are most um, important. And then we have um, native and invasive species. And I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. In a minute the difference in phenology. And here's just some of the methods where we go out into the woods and we observe what's going on. This is just a nice picture of a wild geranium. Some of our students um, out and about. And this is a, a great horned owl, a little baby owl that was out in the woods one day. So it's a great resource for um, observing wildlife. So some of the observations that we take um, are the usual, it's the usual suspects really. Um, we observe bud burst, leaf out in spring and then leaf color and leaf fall in autumn. This is the site on campus. The dots are just represent where the trees are monitored. So that's an older um, network than the shrubs. The shrubs are more recent than I've been uh, working on um, more recently. And we observe every other day we did for as long as we could because that coincided with the timing of one of the satellites that would go across um, Downer Woods every other day. So we tried to match those. We had four native, oh, sorry. We had four native species and four oh, non-native species. I'm trying to go back and pushing the wrong button um, of shrub. And then we had um, the, the usual suspects, we had white oak, uh, red oak, basswood and ash, but of course there's no ash anymore. So what can possibly go wrong? Some of the things that can go wrong for us when we are in the field is here is an example of a dead tree that uh, crushed our wild current. Then we had mold on the nanny berry, insect damage. We had the viburnum beetle like devastate all of the leaves. So it wasn't so bad in spring, but we couldn't do any observations of autumn phenology. And then we have frost damage as well. But I mean, the frost damage is uh, in the autumn, that's kind of the first frost. So we see a very clear um, indication of what happens when, when the first frost occurs. You know, then we, we um, stop monitoring. I keep pressing the wrong buttons. Then with the ash trees, of course, we see the ash trees um, started to die off. And at the moment, Downer Woods is closed for the removal of these ash trees. But when the ash tree is removed, it leaves a hole in the canopy, which allows a huge amount of light in. And that, once the light gets in, the shrubs take off hugely. And in particular, the invasive species um, take off once, once the light increases. <clears throat> 
So some of our data. Now, I know this slide is a bit busy, but I'm just going to tell you a couple of um, things from this slide. First of all, the green area represents the timing of bud burst. So this is springtime. And the browner or the darker areas is autumn. I've only three years of data here. And this is the shrub community as a whole. So this here shows us that the shrubs started to green up, they started to become green at around about, let's say, around about the 10th of April in 2019. And they finished around about the 30th of April. So three or four weeks, actually about five weeks on average for the spring to occur. That's to go from dormant bud to leaf fully unfolded. But you can see huge difference between this year, between 2019 and 2018. In 2018, leaf out, uh, spring phenology started much later in the season, like a lot later, but progressed very quickly. So the duration of the spring from dormant bud to full leaf unfolded is much shorter. So it goes much more rapidly. And this is interesting because this is a cold year. So we see the spring temperature was cold and it didn't warm up until later in the season. But once the temperature started to increase, the shrubs responded very quickly. So earlier in this, when the shrubs start to bud burst earlier in the season, we know that the spring, that the spring temperature was warmer earlier. So just a few different things then. If you just look down all the way down here, there's not a huge difference I mean, there's some difference, but it's not hugely difference for between the non-native shrubs and the native shrubs. So the timing of spring is not hugely different between native and non-native shrubs, except one of the phenophases, leaf out, tends to occur later in the non-native species. So in the invasive species, leaf out tends to occur later. Now, we always thought that leaf out in invasive species started earlier to give the invasives a competitive advantage. But they're clever. They leaf out a little bit later than the native species. But once they leaf out, they, they progress a lot faster. And that is a very interesting strategy because if they lay, leaf out a little bit later, it means they're less vulnerable to a late frost. It means that the, the native species, they might leaf out a bit earlier, but they're more vulnerable to a late frost. So we don't have enough years of data to really determine if this pattern is clear. But it's, it's interesting to watch. We, we're, we kind of think that that's kind of what's happening. But in the autumn, things are very, very different for the non-native species. The non-native species clearly hold on to their leaves for a lot longer. They stay greener longer into the autumn season than the non, uh, than the native shrubs. But you can see there's always one exception. This one particular Viburnum opulus, <coughs> um, highbrush cranberry, it behaves more similar to the native species than the non-natives. And it's, it's a very similar species. Um, it's a European species, but it's very, very similar to some of the native species that we have here. So even though it's an invade, it's a non-native invasive, it behaves very similar to a native species. And then even though I, I you'd be thankful I didn't put the tree data on this graph as well, because it would confuse things even more. But just when we look at the trees, the trees start to leaf out two weeks later than the shrubs in autumn, and they tend to finish about a month earlier. So the spring duration for trees lasts about three weeks compared to five weeks for the shrubs. And the autumn season lasts about four weeks, about a month for the trees, but about two months for the um, shrubs. And that means that the shrubs are just so important at the extremes of the season. So that's our in situ data. So as I mentioned earlier, we also look at um, we also look at satellite data as well. So we got involved with this new, this with a new small little microsatellite that was being launched um, by, it was a joint Israeli-French um, collaboration. And they set off this uh, rocket from Guyana in South America. And talk about a small world. 
I was telling my brother um, about this rocket that was going off, it's going to be launched into space. It was going to launch this little micro satellite that was going to look at vegetation and um, environment monitoring. So I was telling him about this and he's like, hang on a minute. A friend of his was actually at the launch of that rocket in Guyana that was um, sending the micro satellite into space. So anyway, just small, small world. But this is a small satellite and it has 12 spectral bands that can monitor. One of the things it can monitor is vegetation, but also other things it can monitor water and also cloud and atmospheric um, pollution and different things. It has a two day revisit time and a five to 10 meter um, resolution. So it's very high resolution, um, both temporally and spatially. And there's about 120 sites of special interest that it is monitoring. And Darna Woods happened to be one of them. So in order to retrieve the data from the satellite and in the name of science, of course, I took off, put on my spacesuit and off I went. And here's some of the data that um, I collected from the satellite. So what I want to show you here is there are a vast number of satellites producing a vast number of products that can be used to look at vegetation in many different ways. And here are just a couple of them. I just wanted to put, this is our Venus satellite. It has a spatial resolution of five to 10 meters. So that's pretty small. It has a two day return visit and it covers um, 120 sites. And there's only a couple of years. It was just, um, uh, it, we only have two years data from it. MODIS is a much bigger satellite and it, it or a much bigger space program. And, but they have a spatial resolution of 250 meters. So this is one MODIS pixel. So, and you can see this is Darna Woods behind it. So that's the size of the MODIS pixel. So this gives us one piece of information about phenology of the entire site. Whereas if you look at this image here, each little pixel gives us some information on phenology or, or on vegetation, not necessarily phenology, but on vegetation. So the Venus satellite is a, has better, higher resolution. Then we have other ones. The MODIS has a daily return. It has global coverage and there's information available from the year 2000. Another satellite is the Virus satellite. And again, different resolution and different time series. And all of these other ones are the same. Landsat is one you might have heard of. It has a very good spatial resolution. 30 meters, which is a lot better than the 250, but it only returns every 16 days. So that's not much good if you're looking for phenological changes because they occur over a shorter time period. And if you miss one day, uh, it, the next return day would only be 16 days later. So if there are clouds in the area or if for some reason there's some missing data, it's not you're not going to be able to um, get much useful information on the vegetation. And then we have a range of different um, vegetation indices. You don't need to know anything about these, but just there are lots of different ways to get information about phenology. So basically what we're looking at with the satellite data is when the greening starts. Here we have peak season, so peak green. But in the autumn, um, the satellites will monitor the browning down or the changing in the color of the vegetation from green to brown. And in the spring, we see a change from brown and then we have this period of green up until we find peak green. So basically we can get a phenological profile for the year. And that's kind of what we see here. In this slide, we have the, this area here is Downer Woods, and the area outside is the um, city. So we can see there's a very clear vegetation signal, or just this is a very different signal from outside. So we can we know that there's something different here. And all of these different 
vegetation indices just have slightly different parameters and we have to find which is the best one for our um, use. And it turns out that EVI, <laughs> the Enhanced Vegetation Index, is the best one for us because we can get better um, definition or we can see variation in the vegetation with this. Whereas with this one here, it's just completely all red. It's super saturated, so it's not much good to us. But basically, just this is the best one for us. So, and then, of course, we have 2018 and 2019. We only have data for two years. And if you look at this, this is the first year data. It's pretty, you know, it's not very smooth. It's not very reliable. There are lots of missing data. Um, and this was because there was lots of downtime for the satellite. It improves a little bit better in uh, 2019. So we see that the EVI, the vegetation index, increases in spring and then starts to decline over the summer. And eventually it will go down to zero um, again in the autumn. So there is some correlation with the in situ data, but not a whole lot at this stage. So even though we have high spatial resolution and high temporal re resolution, we're not seeing really good um, correlation between the two. So what are some of the, the reasons for the um, changes in the correlation or the differences between the two methods of observing? Well, first of all, we have, this is Downer Woods um, on the 23rd of October, 2019. And we can see this is our students out taking observations. If we look at the trees, we're not seeing very much, um, the leaves have pretty much fallen or they're colored. But our buckthorn in the background, this is one of our invasive species, is very green. This is what we're seeing from the pheno cam, from the, the camera. And this is, information extracted from the phenocam. This is the greenness extracted from the phenocam. And here's peak green right in the middle of the um, summer. And here's on the 23rd of October. So the phenocam is saying that really there's not much going on. It's very, very um, brown down. There's not much green going on. Whereas if we are monitoring shrubs, we're saying, well, look, it's very green. The phenocam is showing somewhere in between and then the satellite image is also um, giving us information about the vegetation and just showing us uh, the kind of density at this, this stage. And it's saying everything's still pretty green here as well. So we just have differences um, in the different methods that we're using. So the direct observations of individual um, trees, or we have the phenocam, this takes a picture every 30 minutes and gives us this thing called the green chromatic coordinate or greenness. So that's pretty much um, this. But it's interesting because you can see that it greens up in spring, stays green during the growing season, and then browns down in the autumn. So oh, I keep, where am I? So why do we see some discrepancies between in situ and satellite remote sensing data? Well, for a start, if we look at the in situ observations, if we are out, I just took this photograph from one of the streets um, last year. And if the, the view angle from the remote sensing is from above, so the remote sensing is looking down and it will observe this tree as be, if this tree was in a forest and the satellite is from above, 100% leaf color. So autumn is well underway. But if we're down here observing from underneath, we're saying that these tree, this tree is 100% green and there's no sign of any leaf color. So that is one reason for the discrepancy, the leaf angle, or the view angle. We're viewing from below the satellite from above. And here we can see something very similar. We would be observing this as completely green from below, whereas the satellite is saying, no, completely um, leaf color. And if these are all packed together in a forest, you know, we can't see the canopy. In, in situ data, we can only cover a smaller number of species, usually trees, usually clone trees in different uh, locations. So we have very poor spatial coverage, whereas the satellite data 
will give us an integrated um, data point from all the vegetation in the area. So we could have early leafing and late leafing. The satellite data gives us information continuous year round, whereas we're usually limited to spring and autumn. Ours is very subjective. If you go, people go out and they would have say, well, is that 10% leaf color, 50% leaf color? You know, it's way more subjective than the uh, remote sensing. And the remote sensing, obviously the AI would be able to tell you exactly what percentage of the leaves were colored. But the satellites then are difficult to um, judge as well because they have different sensors and different vegetation indices as well. So that's why we're seeing different, the, we're observing different things really. The tree is observing, or the um, person is observing the color of the trees, whereas the remote sensing is looking at the, the greenness as well, but in a different way, it's looking at the, the reflective properties of the leaves. So one other thing, actually, I don't really have time to talk about this, but talking about greenness, where we're looking at autumn color. And what we found was, this is just the, the temperature record. This shows the temperature record in Downer Woods one of the years. And we can see it was warm. And then we have a sudden change in the temperature where it gets cooler. And interestingly, that did not affect the chlorophyll content of the leaves. So they still look green, but it did have a significant impact on the photosynthesis of the leaves. So even though the leaves were green, they were not photosynthesizing um, throughout the time period. So basically we looked at the shrubs, they extend the growing season of the temperate deciduous um, forest. There's a difference between natives and non-natives. Our Venus data is looking promising but there are too many data gaps um, to make any clear connection between the in situ and the remote sensing data. And we've still got a lot of work to do on that. So I'm going to leave it there. And thank you very much for your um, attention. And if I, I'll take any questions.